Hello, today we're going to be looking at the keys to the kingdom. We looked at this earlier at our service at 9 o'clock, and it began with uh, looking at Romans, the 12th chapter, which says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members one of another. We have gifts that may differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion with faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. So St. Paul, here's a man who had his ups and downs in ministry. He was very much against the church at first, persecuting the church, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But now he is going around the world. He has a heart not only for the Jewish people, but for all the Gentiles as well. So he has, like I say, a heart for the Jewish world, but he goes all around the Mediterranean world on these trips because he has been touched by the grace of God. Once a persecutor of the church, now he goes around to talk about the grace of God, which allows each of us to have our own gifts. For him, once he fell from his horse and was blinded and then healed, he came to see the grace of God was there for him. Jesus was his rock. And because Jesus was a rock, that was a key for him. We're going to be talking about the keys of the kingdom. This was the key for St. Paul, to know that the grace of God wasn't going to leave him. And it can be a key for you as well to unlock your potential. You know, the keys of the kingdom aren't uh, the keys of St. Peter locked away in the big church, but rather the grace of God flowing out into our lives. What a key it is to know the grace of God. And because of this grace of God, we can live out our varied talents. We're not all the same. We're not meant to be the same. Many members, one body. One of the gifts Paul talks about is prophecy. Now we sometimes think of prophecy as like a Notre Dame type of person who knows what tomorrow will bring. By the way, Notre Dame said a lot of things and there's always, you can cut and paste and maybe there's something that applies to now. But the prophets of the Old Testament were prophets of truth. They took the truth of God and expanded it out into the world. And the Spirit of God is like the wind for them. It blew in the direction God was headed. And therefore it looked like they knew the future, but not so much knowing the future as the prophets were people that told the truth. And a lot of times I got them in trouble. And we'll talk about that more next week, about the suffering that can come our way even when we're doing the good will of God. Here's a nice pastor, not as nice as the one you're listening to, but we can all be ministers, one to another. This is a gift that is given to people, that they're there for one another. It's a beautiful part of the church as we reach out to one another. We're thinking about teachers. Paul talks about that as a gift, and certainly we want to be praying for our teachers. I thought this was a beautiful prayer. For teachers, dear Father in heaven, help me to see the promise in each child entrusted to me. Help me preserve their wonder and trust. In all my decisions, help me be just. Give me strength to equal the task that is mine. And we do hope that for our teachers, especially during this time when it's very difficult um, to reach out to students across computer screens or if they're there present with them. Uh, very much in danger, really, of their own health as well. So our definite prayers are there for teachers. It did remind me of a moment during this past week at the Democratic Convention where uh, 
Joe Biden was remembering the story when he was a young man stuttering and the teacher uh, who happened to be a nun made fun of him by stuttering as well, Joe Biden. And he came home saddened. Certainly this teacher, this nun didn't live out this uh, prayer to see the promise in each child entrusted to her. But his mom came and told the nun that if you ever do that, make fun of my son again, I'm gonna knock that habit right off your head. So what are the teachers for? They're to see the grace of God, the individual gifts of God in each one. The Republican National Convention is this week, and so the last couple of weeks with the Democratic and Republican conventions, there's a lot of ex exhortation going out there. And Paul sees this can be a gift to urge people on. There's the gift of sharing with others. This is a Kit Kat bar, breaking a Kit Kat bar in half to share it. There's more than one Kit Kat in each one. You know, this isn't the normal way, but here's a person being generous. And I do want to thank the members of our congregation who've been very generous in helping us through. And um, we appreciate your support of our church. He said leadership needs diligence with it. And certainly we have leaders in our congregation. They're very diligent about their task. And we appreciate that. Thank you for all your love and your support and generosity, and all of you that are reaching out to your churches in various ways. How about this one? Reaching out and caring for those around you in cheerfulness. You know, this can be one of the more cheerful things is caring for somebody else. Cheerfulness is contagious, but don't wait to catch it from others. Be the carrier of wisdom yourself. Uh, I thought this cute picture with the dog is, can they can be, all that cheerful for you. Well, this is a rock. Once we understand the grace of God, it's a rock on which we can build our lives and the various gifts that are given to us. We don't all have to be the same, doing the same thing. It's like this beautiful rock garden. Built on a rock, these lovely plants come in various shapes and forms. The other text that talks about this as well is from Matthew, the 16th chapter. When Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, who do you say that I am? St. Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What was the key for Peter? Understanding this grace of God. So that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he told them not to tell anybody that he was the Messiah for a while, because uh, this was something that would get him into a lot of trouble, as we will see. In fact, Peter kind of catches it wrong, and like I say, we'll look at that next week. Caesarea Philippi. Where did it get its name? Well, there was a son of Herod who was uh, Philip, and he wanted to make sure that the Caesar had good opinion of him, and so he built a temple there in front of the temple of Pan. Now, Pan uh, was a nature god, and so if you wanted to have kids, if you wanted to have a good harvest, you would go to the temple for Pan, but he built one as well for Caesar because he thought his rock was Caesar. For other people, as they looked at Pan, they thought nature, and we'll reach out to nature to a creature like this to kind of help us out. Who is your rock? What do you say that Jesus is? Well, there's a lot of opinions out there. This is what they call the 12 tribes of American politics of uh, black Protestants, religious right, heartland warriors. They have white bread Protestants down there as well. So a lot of different groups uh, that look at Jesus in various ways. But if you set your self on Christ, and I, this is the concern I have that so many you see under the age of uh, uh, 20 now uh, are looking more and more as uh, non-religious as something they'll live into. You know, in the past, we've gotten things wrong 
Doctors smoke camels more than any other cigarette. How about that? Those doctors aren't still with us, I'm afraid. Then uh, television has wonderful benefits for your children. Another thing that we don't hear too much. How about caffeine toothache drops, instantaneous cure? Things change as we go through life. Opinions change. The Pharisees had an opinion of Jesus as a son of Beelzebub. Others thought, well, Jesus must be John the Baptist come back, or maybe he's Elijah, and we talked about Elijah a couple of weeks ago. It's on our website for those who are just joining us. And uh, Jeremiah, one of those prophets suffering for the truth. In this, he's pictured thrown into a pit. But who do you say that I am? This is the real crux of the matter, is what do we think of Jesus ourselves? For Peter, at that moment, it was like God whispered into his ear and told him to confess that Jesus was the son of the living God. And once Peter understood that and understood that Jesus is the one to listen to, and what does he reveal? But the grace of God. And he revealed it to Peter over and over again in his life. Remember just a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Peter who came out of the boat, walked to Jesus, called to me and I'll walk on the waves with you. Then he saw the wind and psh, down into the waves he went. Well, we'll see it over and over again in his life. Even in fact, in this confession, not shortly after, he says, oh, Jesus, don't go to the cross. That's not necessary for you to do. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So Peter definitely has its ups and downs in life. He'll deny Jesus three times. Most people remember that. In fact, I think it's wonderful that we remember it because Peter is the one who would have relayed that story. Jesus is the rock to him. And no matter what he's done, no matter what happens in his life, he can go back to that rock. Even if it's at times something he has done, disappointed his Lord, and yet he can always go back there. He has the key. The key is letting loose of things that are regrets for us and not binding ourselves to anger in our lives, but letting it go. And because of that, he is the foundation for the church. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church built its great cathedral on top of the burial ground of St. Peter itself. And that's where it gets its name, St. Peter. So the early church, this is one of the earliest drawings of Jesus in the early church. The early church understands the grace of God. It understands that Jesus washes feet and bows down for us. He's that kind of king. And so the creator of the universe is one that cares for us. From the beginning of time, it wasn't done just uh, by chance, but rather by a caring creator who longs and looks to us. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who is he in your life? If he can be the one who proclaims grace to you, this is a wonderful rock on which to build your life. We share each Sunday at our church communion where Jesus says, it's not enough for me to just say words and you to listen to words that I say. I want to be inside your life. I want my body and my blood to flow into you and be a part of who you are. I want my grace always to be there for you. Do you think that is the creator of the universe? That's what he wants us to know. That's what St. Peter and St. Paul learned from Jesus and if we learn that wonderful news, we can be a part of the body of Christ, doing our thing. We're not all meant to do the same thing in our life. Each of us can reach out in our own way. There's a wonderful story about Jimmy Walker. He was one of the members of my church when I was in Hemet at Trinity Lutheran. And he was passing away. He was on hospice. He was on dialysis. His wife, Lois, was a wonderful presence there for him all through it. And he said, you know, I just don't want to leave this world without Lois. Now, I'm not sure Lois was willing to leave this world. She was caring for Jim. She was caring for her mom. But what he meant to say is, I want to believe that there's someone out there as loving and caring as my wife Lois has been for him. And she was there in wonderful ways. I can say he was on dialysis, hospice, all kinds of ways that she would reach out to him. There is that kind of grace that can be there for us if you believe that Jesus is the rock. And based on his grace and caring and love, you can live out your life. Look at it, St. Peter and St. Paul, people who went up and down the mountain 
down into the valleys, and yet always knew that God would be there. It's a lovely garden that can be ours if we'll follow that grace of God. I hope that's true for you today, and thank you for listening. And we'll see you next week.